Hello, and thank you for joining us uh, in our studio this day. We are the Christadelphians coming to you to discuss the second part of our wonderful program entitled God's Master Plan. And in the first program, we discussed the, the need that God has revealed to us for his help in ultimately achieving that, that wonderful purpose and that it cannot be done through any other means. And, and this is a very much a, a humbling, yet also a very satisfying uh, hope in mind that God indeed has a master plan for the earth to establish his glory upon it. And indeed, the key to God's fulfilling of this master plan is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, God's only begotten Son, that shall return and bring about God's glorious kingdom upon this earth. Indeed, we have a great hope in that future. And here with us today in the studio is Peter Dulles, a friend and brother from the church who helped present to us God's master plan in the first part. And now to bring you the sequel, we welcome Peter. Thanks very much for coming back. Nice to be here. And uh, we enjoy having you here to uh, help uh, reveal to the audience uh, through some of your understanding of uh, Bible scripture uh, verses that uh, show us uh, this wonderful hope for the future. And uh, let's start it off by simply asking, why do we need a master plan from God? Well, very good question. You know, we know that in the beginning in Genesis that man had fallen from grace uh, and that he was sent forth from the garden. Uh, and God had sort of set up a barrier at that particular time. And so God's master plan, in essence, when we look at it in the simplest sense, is really to save us from the sin and death and from the, the curse of sin and death. Uh, so that's one part. And through Christ, of course, we've got the opportunity now to have a covering for our sins, to have a forgiveness of our sins as well. Now, what, what exactly uh, stops us uh, from uh, participating is there anything uh, beyond uh, us that, uh, is there something in the world that would uh, actually try to thwart our being part of that God's master plan? Well, you know, to be honest, you know, the only thing that can really stop us is ourselves. You know, like we, we have free will to choose right from wrong. We can be associated with God's great promises that have been made, or we can just ignore it and go our merry way. Uh, but, you know, we will face the consequences because of that. And so really the door is wide open to us and we need to understand, you know, that our own nature. We need to understand our own proneness to sinfulness. Now, okay, we're, we're backtracking a little bit, but uh, really, can you take us through uh, the origin of sin? Well, that's a great place to start. And if we look at sin, what we need to do is we need to go to the slide on the screen and look back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Because God had said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. This was God's plan and purpose in the very beginning. And God saw in verse 31 everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So in the beginning, everything was good. Everything should have continued that way. It wasn't perfect. But what went wrong, I guess, is, is really the question there. And we know what went wrong. Man disobeyed God. Uh, that was really what went wrong. And so the outcome of that is sin. He sinned, and God said, The day that thou eatest thereof, of this tree that I told you not to eat of, thou shalt surely die. And, and that was the nature then afterwards that came upon man. Well, through the, the course of uh, the history of mankind, we would have to ask then, how does that affect us today? Like what? What ramifications are there? What are the circumstances of all this? How does this affect us? Well, you know, when we look at the origin of sin, and, and we know from uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and, and we look at this, this uh, verse upon the screen, matter of fact, because it's such an important verse. It tells us how sin came into the world. And through Adam and Eve's disobedience, it, therefore, it says, by one man, and Eve is included in this, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. And so what we've got there is really the origin of sin. And the effect, we could say, of sin was a multitude of things that happened in the Garden of Eden. Are you, are you saying, Peter, that it's, it's not just a mistake that we can erase, as it were? 
it's, you know, there was a dra dramatic change that happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And we can see that uh, really from Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. First of all, God did say that in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So in dying thou shalt die is the, the Hebrewism of that expression. And it's true. You look at the next genealogies that are in chapter 4 and 5, and he died, and he died, and he died. And that's how, that was the end of the, the story for all of those faithful that lived, faithful and not faithful. Uh, and as well in, in uh, Genesis 3.16, we understand that something happened now where suffering came in to the world of, of, of Adam and Eve because he was told that in, uh, you, in the sweat of thy brow thou shalt uh, mm -hmm. eke out a harvest and a living in, for thyself. Eve was told that in sorrow thou shalt bear children. And so there's something, this is not the way it was in the beginning of the Garden of Eden. So you got the aspect of mortality, morality changing. Uh, you got the idea of suffering. You've got this battle in the mind now. The Lord says from within the heart comes evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, you know, fornications, all from within. And so something had dramatically changed because that's not, we understand how God made man at the beginning because he said that he saw everything and it was very good. So a number of these different changes took place and of course the ultimate uh, was that there was now a division between God and man. You know, God drove out the man, it says, uh, out of the Garden of Eden and he placed at the east of the garden cherubims, you know, to keep the way of the tree of life. You know, lest man have an opportunity to go back there and in essence could have been an immortal sinner but that was not to be the case. But what we have now is a body that's corrupt and of course a mind that's prone to sinfulness. That, that's really the change that happened there. Okay, so uh, because of sin, it, it, it seems uh, well, it's pretty obvious that uh, we've been uh, somewhat excluded from this uh, continual uh, undying state. And really, you know, what, what is a biblical future for mankind in this sinful state? You know, what is the destiny of man then without God's master plan? Well, that's right. And you know, that answer is, is, uh, is found in Romans 6 where it says the wages of sin is death. So it's pretty simple. You know, if we just live out our life the way it is right now, you know, if we give in to the lust of our flesh, you know, we're here for a good time and not a long time type of mentality, the end of that is going to be, you know, death. Because death is the punishment for sin. And our destiny then is just a grave. That's all we got to look forward to. Uh, however uh, unfortunate uh, that is, we, uh, we have to realize that uh, before we are to come to some kind of uh, resolution that we're going to do something about it, we have to understand that really we are a, a, a dying creature. And that's, that's everywhere around us, except for the views that mankind has seemingly uh, erroneously interjected into us uh, believing that, uh, no, 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 there's something that goes beyond the grave. Do you have any uh, specific information from scriptures that show what it is like when man is said to be dead in the grave? That's right. If we uh, look at this, this uh, three verses on the screen here, it's very, very clear uh, about the grave. You know, in Psalm 6, verse 5, it says, For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave, there, who shall give thee thanks? You know, in Psalm 146, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. And Ecclesiastes 9 sort of caps it off by saying, For the living know that they will die, but the dead, they know not anything. There is no more further reward for them, and even the memory of them is forgotten. So there's no praise, you know, there's no thoughts, they know nothing. I mean, that, that is what really is held out for man without the hope of the master plan and, and the hope of the kingdom to come and Christ who will sit upon the throne. Now, getting back to uh, what we had mentioned in the, uh, the first show of uh, God's master plan, that it, it seems that um, because there only was the one man who actually escaped death, and because that being due to a, a sinless life, God's only begotten son, that Jesus is very much a, a key component uh, to this master plan and that uh, we certainly have to appreciate his role in fulfilling our way out of that same grave to be un unlocked 
out of eternal death in the way that uh, he led the way. Uh, what uh, does the Bible say regarding the, the promises uh, that will include us in that? Well, you know, if uh, we look at these slides that we have here, there's two verses in particular in the, uh, the Old Testament that are very, very important. And the promises are really the means of uh, fulfilling the master plan. And the seed that we talked about before is really the key to the master plan, the seed pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we got in Genesis 22, a promise made to Abraham that says, In blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, thy descendants in other words, as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And in thy seed, now talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And the promise is that David, we hear very, very similar words. When thy days shall be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. That's the element of death there, the aspect of sleeping. And I will set up thy seed, Jesus, after thee, and he shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And so the means to the master plan that we have right here seems all to come together in this particular seed pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, getting back again to uh, those Old Testament verses where we've seen that uh, there's always uh, a future reference to this coming seed. And as the Hebrew Scriptures have always uh, described uh, the specific uh, role played by someone that they've called uh, their Messiah. Now, just to continue that on into the New Testament, Peter, is there something in the, the New Testament that describes, again, the continuation of that seed? Well, once again, you, you need only go to Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Uh, it talks about the angel Gabriel. And once again, it tells us about the seed of David that comes forth. We look at Galatians 3.16, a powerful verse that uh, Paul speaks about the seed of Abraham being Jesus. So w time and time again, whether it be the Old Testament, whether it be the New Testament, you've got this continuation of this seed that's mentioned. And all the time it's pointing forward to Lord Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of that. Well, if I were just to uh, say uh, that in most people's cases, we understand that th there are certainly some uh, wicked people in the earth that uh, God is certainly not pleased with, but uh, is that not the minority? Uh, what about the, the majority of mankind? Do they really need this... Uh, saving seed from God, aren't uh, we, most of us, uh, basically good and acceptable in the eyes of God? Well, you know, I've, I've heard that quite often, actually, when you, when, when you talk to people. And, and, and basically, people perhaps may live a good lifestyle. Uh, does that mean that they're good and they will be accepted when, when uh, Christ returns to establish the kingdom? Well, we're, we're told in Romans 3, verse 23, that for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. So there's nobody that's, you know, that's uh, good. And matter of fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, call me not good. There's only one good, that's the Father which is in heaven. And so sin, we've got to understand, is this which separates us from God. You know, in Isaiah 59, we're told that your iniquities have separated you uh, between you and your God. The iniquities, the sins of mankind is really what separates us from God. And so what we need is to have our sins forgiven. That's the key, you know, to be reconciled and to be part of this great master plan. And therefore, Jesus is that seed. And we're told in Matthew 1 that all about that great birth that shall come to place uh, and Jesus that is born, and it says that he will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus actually means, is he saves. Well, that's uh, very, ful very much a fulfillment of uh, the Bible prophecies that have uh, related how that somebody is going to come, and, and more than just what they wanted at the beginning to save them from their literal enemies, they also needed to be saved here as well, that they had a certain problem called sin. And uh, we've inherited that to this day. Now, specifically, how... Can Jesus save us? What is the, the, the way he has already gone about that process to undo the condition that we're in? Yeah. 
Well, you know, this is one of the, the wonderful things that's uh, sometimes called a mystery in the Bible, but it's not really a mystery because it's really a sacred secret, something that people have to dig and search for to try to understand. And any time you want to understand uh, some of the principles, God's principles that are outlined anywhere in Scripture, you go back to Genesis. And if we look at Genesis chapter uh, 3, verse 7, and we've got a slide here, we'll see that there was a solution that Adam and Eve tried to come up with once they sinned in the Garden of Eden. They made this elaborate type of uh, fig leaf type of an apron, and they tried to cover their sin, but they tried to hide at the same time. Well, that wasn't a solution God had. God's solution, which we learned in Genesis 3.21, was to make these skins. And how were the skins gotten? Well, you can imagine at the time there, there would have been a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. There was a, an animal physically slain. The blood was there, draped over their shoulders in the skin. And, of course, we're told without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. All pointing forward to Christ, who would be that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So Christ is a, a type of covering. That's right. In, in some ways, uh, indicative uh, throughout Scripture as in uh, the sacrifice of that, that first lamb, so that uh, his blood apparently would be a very uh, a strong symbol of what God needed to do and to bring about the, uh, the forgiveness of mankind. But, but the real uh, hard question is, why, why would God, in, in his infinite love, which I'm sure most people uh, would agree upon, as Scripture declares him to be, why would he allow his son, to, his only begotten son, an innocent man, mm -hmm. as we would both agree, uh, to have gone through such a, a horrid, very uh, dramatic and bloody death. Mm. It is a, it's a hard thing to sometimes understand. Uh, but we have to understand that God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but he have eternal life. And what we learn from that is that it's the love of God that brought this together, the giving of his only son. Can you imagine that? And how hard that would be for us, you know, to try to do the same thing with perhaps one of our children. And we're told in Isaiah 53 that with his stripes we are healed. So there was, a, once again, from the Garden of Eden, pointing forward, the shedding of the blood, and Christ who would be the fulfillment of that, all because of the love of God. And so sin was so abhorrent in God's eyes that God had to teach mankind uh, that through Christ's sacrifice that we likewise have to sacrifice the flesh with its affections and lusts, you know, to be acceptable unto God. God wants us to be part of his master plan. Well, if, if God does want us to be part of his master plan, then really the, such weight was borne by, by one specific man that had you know, the, the, the weight of the world upon his shoulders what would compel a man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to undergo such a, a, a horrid death? What, what was in his mind? What, what was he envisioning? How could any man let himself go through something that horrific? Mm -hmm. Well, you've got to understand, the, the, Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, so he was certainly special in that sense. Born of our flesh, born from the lineage of David, but, you know, uh, really with Jesus, he said it, all in one beautiful sentence when he said, greater love has no man that he give us his life for his friends. So love was the driving force in all that the Lord Jesus Christ did. And, but it was beyond that because we understand as well that it was for the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, you know, despised the shame, and that he's now set down on the right-hand side of God. So there was a joy. He saw the bigger picture in everything that he did. And because of that, he was able to go through what he had to go through. In other words, that we as well might be saved in the process that God was, uh, you know, perpetuating mm -hmm. through his master plan. So it, it very much uh, shows that he is most deserving as, as being considered that, that very key, not, not just the, the crux, but I'm, I'm sure scripture says that he's a, uh, a cornerstone, a very pivotal, pivotal part of that plan that uh, demonstrates he is, he is most and only deserving of being considered such. That's right. Matter of fact, uh, we should put up the slide, this next one here, because I think this is a very, very important one. 
Christ, the promised seed, as we've discussed, is the only one who has revealed God's glory in its fullest sense. And it says in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So Christ is the key. He is the only way that we can have forgiveness of our sins to be associated with those promises that God has made to be really associated with God's master plan in a, in a full extent. Okay, Peter, I, I would uh, suspect that our audience would very much like to know at this stage, uh, how can you know, the average, everyday, you know, ordinary people like uh, ourselves, really, there are no greater uh, species of beings. We're all very much part of this uh, human uh, fabric. Uh, we all have the condition of, of being sinful, of, uh, of being weak and frail. Really, the, the, the next important question is, how can we be part of that master plan of God's? That's a great question. What we should put up is this next slide, because this verse in Mark 16:16 16, 16 tells us how we can participate with God's master plan. What's the next step, in other words? Well, Mark says that whosoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And so there's your two components there, the aspect of believing and the aspect of being baptized. Now, what exactly do you mean, or rather, what does the Bible mean regarding belief? Is it just a matter of facts, uh, opinions? Is it a, a statistic to just be knowledgeable of? What exactly does the Bible mean by belief? Well, belief, you know, we can understand in maybe, let's say, three different ways. Belief is definitely comes by understanding, you know, understanding that, all have sinned and that they've come short of the glory of God. Once we understand that, that's really the first step. Belief means having faith, and faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we've got to develop faith, belief, by understanding God's word. We can't get it unless we read it and try to apply ourselves to understanding. And then thirdly, belief means understanding. We learn in John 17:3 that this is life eternal, that thou might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou sent. So knowledge, understanding of God and Christ is key to belief. Okay, so whoever believes will ultimately have that hope of being saved. But, you know, is it good enough uh, then to just be baptized and, and then we're just automatically saved, as we've heard people say? Uh, no, not at all. You know, besides the aspect of believing, there has to be an element of true repentance. You know, one has to really see themselves for what they are and then repent, you know, that they want to have a change. Well, uh, it's a word that only comes up in biblical discussions, but uh, really, what does the Bible mean by repentance? Well, repentance, you know, simple is a 180 degree turnaround. You know, we were walking after the lust of the flesh, after our own desires, you know, doing our own thing. But once we come to an understanding of the truth, we can see a bigger picture of what's happening upon this earth. So we make that turn and now we're actually heading in a different direction with that repentance, it brings a change in our life. You know, if we truly believe, and if we're truly sorry, you know, then we will be repentful. Well, I've heard of several different versions of baptism. Uh, we've heard that uh, children can be sprinkled, that there's different uh, ways of uh, going about it, at no matter the age. Uh, what does the Bible say about that, Peter? You know, if you look just at that word baptism in, uh, baptismo in Greek, actually, and see where it comes from, it's actually a word that was used in the, uh, the garment, the dyeing of garment trade, and it meant a full immersion. You know, the garment was fully immersed, came out changed. And what a wonderful illustration of baptism. You know, you look at Philip uh, in the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts, when they found water, they went there, they were fully immersed. And when they come up, it was changed. Look at the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he went down fully into the water, came back up, because it had to mean something. It had to mean the death of that individual, symbolically, and the rising to the newness of life. And so I think there's a little bit more encompassed with the illustrations in Scripture rather than just the sprinkling at birth with a baby that really doesn't know right from wrong. Right. So, again, how does uh, baptism fit into the master plan? Is it really necessary? How important is it in the eyes of God that we do get baptized? Well, it's, 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 really, it's really, really important. Uh, let's look at this slide on the screen here. Galatians 3, verse 27, verse 29 says, For as many as have been baptized, you know, have been associated with the promises, 
made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can't be associated with the master plan unless you're baptized, and you have it right there. And that's the key to it right there. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, once again, uh, we do appreciate your bringing about your understanding of the Word of God. And to our friends at home, again, we have a slide at the, the end here that uh, shows you how you can get in contact with us and how to go about finding your place in God's master plan. Indeed, what we were discussing today was very important. Uh, now is the day of our salvation, as Scripture describes. Please make your decision and look into these vital words of God. Please give us a call. We'll be looking forward to it. May God bless your study of His Word.